Hello, everyone. We are just live now with the seventh edition of the BAD Meetup. Um, for those that are new here, BAD stands for Business and Data. And the goal of the Meetup is really to address topics from the intersection of business topics in general and the data field. So everyone's welcome. Uh, if you want to get some more information, please check out the Meetup page and stay informed and tuned in for the next editions as well. This edition specifically uh, is done together with Restack. That's why they're responsible for all of this looking so cool, to be frank. <laughs> um, and today we'll be topping, talking about uh, the topic of deploying open source for scale scalable data warehouses. And we have the privilege to host great speakers that are calling in from three continents. So you can say that the bad meetup from a Berlin small thing has gone intercontinental. Um, so today, first of all, we're going to hear from Madi, the senior data engineer from Zendesk. Um, then we'll have a sh short uh, demo uh, by Shruti Kuber, uh, showing us some things about uh, how Restack works. And afterwards, we have a deep dive into DBT together with Victoria, formerly of Tier, and soon starting at DBT Labs itself. Yes, she's that good. Oh. And at the end, we'll have a panel discussion where also we'll be joined by Kelly Bourdin from Wealthy. Um, so all in all, it's 60 minutes. I try to keep it short and crisp. Uh, please post your questions in the in comments and, and I'll try to address those uh, together with, with the speakers and panelists later on. So that's it from my side and Mari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Salim. Oh, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, I think we can get started with presentation. So today, my, my presentation is related to an article that I published a couple of months ago that had the same name, basically, which is building an end-to-end -end open source modern data platform. Um, so in the presentation, I'll be going through the main components that I discussed. Uh, but if you want a deeper dive or if you want to have more details, it's a 17 minute article. So you can, you can jump to the article afterwards. Um, so let's get started by first introducing myself. So I have been working in the data engineering space for around five years now, uh, initially within the Hadoop ecosystem, but then I moved into the cloud transformation and now with modern data stack technologies. Uh, I worked at multiple companies. I'm currently at Zendesk, but before that I worked at FactSet, Crédit Agricole here in Paris, and also at um, an tech company called Numbly. Um, I'm personally very passionate about open source projects, and I think that one privilege we have in the data space is that uh, there is a very strong open source community uh, around most of the tools that we use, and so it's, um, it's great to be um, working within this space and also within the open source community. So after that, let's get started. Um, the question that I asked myself before writing the article was, did the open, did the modern data stack get so much sure that we can actually build something end-to-end -end from scratch in less than an hour? And this is basically to answer two different questions. First one is, we know that for SaaS platforms, one of the main selling points is that it just works and you can buy a tool set it up and get, get up and running. And on the other hand, for open source, um, there is that reputation of it needs a bit of more work, it needs more configuration, you will come across issues that you need to solve on your own. So it's usually a bigger commitment. And also in terms of interconnectivity, um, how well do the open source tools in the modern data stack connect to each other? How well does it all play around together to actually build something uh, that can deliver the full scope of what you expect from data platform with just open source tools. Um, and to answer the question, we can actually spoil the answer from now because we're interested in how to build it, um, more than like to actually how, what, what is the actual answer? Because it, the answer is yes, otherwise we wouldn't have this, this talk today. Uh, and we actually reach that level of a modern data stack of building an end-to-end -end platform using only open source technology and delivering everything you would expect uh, from a modern data stack and a modern data, data platform. So let's talk about the rules, the rules of the challenge. First one, we're going to be building an end-to-end -end platform. So we won't cheat and just use two tools and say, hey, we have a platform. 
We actually want to have the whole scope of, um, of a modern data stack platform. We want to ingest data, we want to transform it, and we want to actually deliver data products. So we'll be building an actual dashboard. The second point is that we're only going to be using open source tools and the resources that you have via any typical cloud provider. So in terms of storage or compute, uh, we can rely on cloud providers. But in terms of the tools, we'll be focusing on the open source offering. And the third point is that we, we actually want to have all the components of a modern data stack, so whether it's metadata management, whether it's actually data visualization or even ELT, we want to actually leverage all these components. And finally, uh, the idea is to build this within an hour, but we want it to scale, whether in terms of data scalability, if we have more data, we should be able to handle it. And also in terms of business complexity, we want to build something that can handle a small use case to get started, but can also scale uh, if we have more complex business problems to solve. Um, so with that, let's get started with blank canvas. So basically we want to be able to retrieve data from any input source, whether it's an API, whether it's a SaaS platform, whether it's just raw data files that you have on, on any file system. Uh, we want to be able to ingest that into data warehouse. We want to be able to actually transform it to deliver created data sets and data sets that we can leverage for business use cases. And on top of these data sets, we want to actually build dashboards and the BI layer to be able to interact with it and deliver something to, to end users. Uh, and finally, we want all this to be connected to a metadata, metadata management platform so, we get, so that we can leverage metadata itself. We can discover all of these data assets. We can have a data catalog and we can know for each asset who's the owner, who I can reach if I have a question about this data asset, whether it's a dashboard, whether it's a data set or a table. Uh, for all of that, we're gonna be leveraging the data management platform. So let's get started with the most important break in, in this platform, which is the data warehouse itself. Uh, and you may say that, well, if we go with BigQuery, isn't it not an open source technology? The answer is yes, but um, the answer is also that's fine for this break because what we're basically looking for is something that's scalable that we can get started with uh, and that's also serverless. Uh, and BigQuery answers on all of these fronts. Uh, it's part of GCP offering. So even if you create a free account on, on GCP and you have like $300 to get started with, you can immediately start using BigQuery. Uh, you can use it for even just a small file as your input, or if your data scales to terabytes and petabytes of data, it's still gonna be delivering on that. Uh, and so we want to leverage the fact that it's serverless, the fact that it's cheap for our use case, and the fact that it uh, doesn't necessitate any configuration to get started. Uh, if you want an open source components for a data warehouse also, uh, Postgres can deliver the same. And if you want to avoid using a cloud platform, which, which is something you should do in, in this day and age. But if you want to avoid cloud platform, uh, Postgres would be an alternative for BigQuery here. Um, so now that we have the data, uh, data warehouse, let's start ingesting the data into it. And to do that, we basically need to think about the E and L of ELT. And basically, we want to extract the data, load it into the data warehouse. And for that, in the modern data stack, I think the obvious answer nowadays is Airbyte, which is quite interesting because it's a company that got started less than two years ago. And somehow they managed to build a very strong open source community tour, um, around the project. Uh, they're nearly on parity in terms of connectors with Fivetran, which is a big leader in this, um, in this space. Uh, the product itself can be set up in a matter of minutes on a compute engine on GCP. Uh, it's containerized. It's basically a very smooth operation to, to get up and running. And afterwards, you can connect it to your input data, whether, again, whether it's an API or um, a SaaS application, you can con configure it to connect to it. And then you have on the other side, the output on the data warehouse as your destination. So now we're only a few minutes in and we have our data in the data warehouse. Uh, next step would be to actually transform the data into curated data sets and uh, data that we can serve to business users. And this is where DBT comes along. And with DBT, basically, it's probably the most, uh, the most famous technology in the modern data stack. Uh, you have everything that you used to do with SQL, but now you have a lot of additional functionalities like using macros, 
like having documentation that's built in for you, um, tests that are built in also with your with your whole stack, and a lot of other features, which actually will be discussed again in, in this meetup. And so with DBT, you can have a transformation. You can basically do uh, everything you actually would want to do on your, uh, on your data warehouse in a very efficient manner, in a version manner, and use a lot of functionalities like snapshots, mac macros, and other, other functionalities that DBT offers. Now that we have the data ready uh, to consume it, we can use another open source product in modern data stack, which is Apache Superset. Um, it was actually launched a few years ago at Airbnb, and it got a lot of traction. And honestly, if you look at the BI space, it's probably the tool that offers the biggest number of features as an open source project. Uh, it's very similar to what you would find with Tableau or with Power BI, but you can actually use an open source project for it. Again, you can deploy it on a compute engine on, on GCP and get up and running. And finally, now that we have the whole stack, um, we come to the final break, which is metadata management. For this, it's a product that I'm personally very passionate about, which is open metadata. It aims to standardize uh, the whole space of metadata and how it's managed, how it's offered via open standards and via APIs. Um, it's a very powerful product behind the scenes, but all of that is abstracted. It leverages Airflow, Elasticsearch, MySQL, but it's also containerized. So for you as a consumer, again, you will only need a few minutes to get tap and running, connected to DPT, Airby, uh, DPT, BigQuery, and Superset, and get all of your resources in one place. So if you want to discover your data sets, if you want to discover dashboards, all of that can happen on open data. Uh, so now that we have the stack up and running, you can start asking questions. And the first question would be about scale. Uh, and you can say, OK, we built this in less than an hour, but what if I want to have something more? What if I want to have all of these products running on clusters instead of just single VMs? Or what if I want to leverage Kubernetes, for example, to do that? The answer is it can scale. And scaling it won't take that much, that much more time or that much more resources. First point is that you should be leveraging an infrastructure as code uh, unit for your deployment instead of doing the deployment manually. Uh, the obvious answer here is Terraform. And so if you leverage Terraform to actually build this, you would be able to scale it, modify the resources that you want to allocate for one of your components, redeploy your stack with different configuration in a matter of minutes again. Uh, Terraform is very easy to get started. You have providers for basically most of the cloud platforms and if you leverage Terraform to, to actually define all this, you would be able to scale it in a matter of minutes. We're also using containers for the whole stack. So all of the tools that I discussed are containerized. And with containers, you can actually modify what's in your tool. You can modify your deployment. And again, you can scale it. So instead of just one VM, you can have 10 nodes for your, for your pipeline. Um, third, third point is regarding business complexity. So we know that it's. It can scale when the data scales, and it can scale on the computer when we need more compute. But what if we have bigger business problems to answer? What if we have more complex business questions? Here, TBT is the answer to that, and it's a node that can actually be leveraged for a very simple initial use case like we saw, but it can also be leveraged for a very complex set of operations. It can answer a wide area of business questions by simply leveraging things like macros, like snapshots, to be able to actually implement all that, again, in a matter of a very short amount of time. Um, and finally, as long as we're using open metadata, if you have two dashboards or 200 dashboards, it's still going to be discoverable. It's going to be very easy to search for your data assets. And for each table and for each dashboard in your stack, you can search for it on open metadata. You can know how much it's used who's the owner of that data product, and if you can trust it or not. Uh, so as long as you're using open metadata, it will be collecting all of this information for you behind the scenes, no matter if you have just one dashboard or 100. Again, for the tables, whether you have just a few tables or thousands of tables, it will catalog all that and allow you to actually um, interact with all of these resources in a very efficient manner. And finally, uh, when you have all of that up and running, uh, you might start thinking about what to do next in terms of your stack, because 
even if we talk about complexity, um, there are still a few breaks that will come along afterwards in your path, like orchestration, for example, that we didn't tackle. Um, so in our initial use case, we were running on dbt scheduler for um for running out jobs but in the future you may want to orchestrate things outside of dbt for which you would need to actually have an orchestration platform uh if you're following the data community in the past few weeks there was a big debate about unbundling versus rebundling uh, the whole data stack and there will be a moment when you need to rebundle and have a tool to actually give you a an idea on all of your tools orchestrate things that touch different tools for example if you want to run, update the superset dashboard when new data set arrives and stuff like that, you would need to actually have an orchestration platform. Um, for data quality, we talked about using TPT for testing the data, but you would also need to, in the future, optimize that and maybe have more features on top of that, for which you have an open source project called Soda SQL, which does a lot of what DBT offers and then a bit more. Um, another point on which you can potentially in the future optimize is going beyond batch for your EL platform. So with Airbyte, uh, one of the constraints if, is that it manages batch data loads and you may find yourself in a situation where it's event-based or you actually want to ingest events. Uh, there is an open source project here again called Jitsu, which does that similar to Segment, for example, and it does that in a very efficient manner. Um, and finally, you may also consider adding more tools and more components that we didn't touch on in this presentation. Uh, you may want to have reverse ETL, for example, if you want to, to ingest all the knowledge that you have in the warehouse into your um, SaaS applications. You can consider having a metric layer to actually uh, unify how you interact with metrics, how you define metrics, and make your also your metrics discoverable, and so on. Uh, and with all of this, you can take the data stack that you built in just one hour into the next level and make it even more efficient and even more robust. Um, that was presentation. Thank you. Thank you again for, um, for having me. And again, there is an article that I published a couple of months ago that has the same name uh, that goes through the same, uh, the same topics in a bit more detail. And there is also a GitHub repository for all of the TR form if you want to deploy it, which I highly recommend. Even if your company uses different tools or even if you're working with different tools, uh, deploying this in your um, own time and playing around with this uh, project is a great way to actually get started. And it's a great way to actually start contributing to them since it's all open source. Thanks a lot, Mari. This was super interesting. Um, there was a question coming in from, uh, from YouTube. Uh, why, why not Snowflake? Like, would, would you also consider Snowflake as the data warehouse instead of BigQuery? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think for um, for this um, example, BigQuery was um, a more interesting option first because it's part of GCP offering. And so it, there is a very straightforward connection with everything on GCP since it's part of a cloud environment uh, and they built the whole stack on GCP. The second point is that BigQuery as a platform, since it got started, it was serverless by default, like the whole architecture behind it. It's basically built to, on the um, separating compute and storage. And so it's very efficient when it comes to that. And when getting started for this particular use case, BigQuery was um, the, the better option. But there are also scenarios in which you would prefer to opt for Snowflake. So again, it's, it's a case by case um, choice. Yeah, and I think I'll just one more question from my side. Why, why do you choose GCP uh, over other cloud platforms? Honestly, because um, again, here it's uh, it was a weekend project, and they have a very interesting like uh, free tire where you have three hundred dollars to build whichever you want on GCP. Uh, this whole thing cost I think twenty five dollars to to get up and running and run for for a couple of days, which is very interesting if if you consider that you can build all this for twenty five dollars. Um, but again, uh, everything that I used on GCP can be found on whether it's on AWS, on Azure, you can find the same stack. Great, Mari. I have way more questions, but you'll address them in the discussion run at the end. So, so stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, and I'd like to invite up over here Shruti, who's the senior developer advocate at Restack. And I think if, if this one hour case is too much for you, then I think she can show something really interesting that will bring this time down even more. 
Definitely. So that's that's why I'm here. I can quickly start with my presentation. So yeah, thanks for introducing me. So hi, my name is Shruti. I am the developer advocate at Racetag. And uh, today I'm going to show you, talk about a use case for a data pipeline, show you what the data pipeline is. And if you were to host it by yourself, I'm going to go through some of the steps. And then I'm going to show you how to do it better with Restack. So let's begin. So you have a general use case. You have Michael Scott Paper Company. And Michael Scott wants to do better. He wants to be better than, better than Dunder Mifflin Paper Company, of course. And uh, he needs to know, he needs to get insights from his sales pipeline. So you know, how many people are you calling? What stage in the pipeline are they? How many deals? Uh, how many people have been reached out and so on? And so he needs to understand this data and he needs to spot some trends and figure out a way to grow Michael Scott Paper Company. And so he decides to build a pipeline wherein he's gonna extract all the data from his, uh, the deal data from his pipe drive. He's gonna uh, do it, of course, using Airbyte. And of course, he's, you know how Michael Scott Paper Company was started. So he wants to use everything open source. So uh, he's gonna use Airbyte to extract this data and put it into his uh, database. And then he's gonna apply deep, like his business logic with DBT and uh, visualize this data with Metabase. And he's gonna orchestrate everything with Airflow. Now, let's say he starts building this pipeline. And so he starts with DBD core. So, okay, uh, install DBD core with DBD qu uh, BigQuery. And then, okay, let's pick, uh, he, he builds his business uh, logic. He pushes it into his GitHub. Next, Airflow. So he installs Airflow with all its dependencies. Then he needs to figure out different connectors, different providers. So he has a bunch of providers to install. So he does that. The same thing with Airbyte. He, uh, he tries to run Airbyte, tests it, everything is fine, and then adds the, uh, the pipe drive connector to it. So, you know, API token, done. Then he goes to Metabase. He installs Metabase, tries it out. Now he still has to do all of this in one, or deploy all of this in one container. So if it is one container, if it is multiple containers, connections, all of that. And then bam, he gets an update in the pipe drive connector. So there is another update in the pipe drive connector and then he has to go back, do all of it, test all of it again, and so on. So there is definitely a huge overhead in terms of deploying it uh, by yourselves and which is why I've, say, I've said that open source can be a boon or a bane. So I'm going to show you how to do it super easy with Restack. So let me pull out my demo quickly. So with Restack, the way I would do is go to app.restack.io and just click on Launch Applications. And once you that, you have a list of open source tools available. So I just click on Airbyte, Airflow, and uh, Metabase. And I click on Launch Applications. And give it a few minutes, and all the three applications will be deployed. So let's see. You have a URL you can directly use. So I go into my Airflow. And if you see the connections, you have all the connections, all, all the providers pre-installed. So you don't have to do anything about it. Now I'm gonna see what my Airbyte looks like. So there you go, Airbyte. I can add my pipe drive connection. So I choose a destination, I do a source, and you see my connection is already ready. So there's my pipe drive connection and let's check Metabase. So Metabase is also deployed, there's a URL. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna quickly show you the DAG I've written for this. So there's my DAG for the whole thing, the whole pipeline. So I have the Airbyte DAG, and then I have something to trigger the DBT tasks where my business logic is. And so I commit the changes, or I basically I commit the DAG, and I go to Airflow. And let's refresh this. And yeah, you have your DAG there. Let's run this. So. Uh, Let's go to the graph. And so what I have is Airbyte is collecting all this data, normalizing it, 
and then dbt will i mean i'll run the business logic with dbt so let's run this or maybe okay it, let's check the data from pipe drive so yeah i have some data which is like simple stupid data that i've loaded uh, of course this is an example so let's run this and we'll see how this data goes into my database. So we have the first step running with the air byte. So it is green, done. So I'm going to check my BigQuery for this raw data. So you can see air byte has already loaded this uh, data from pipe drive. It's also normalized it a little bit. And then let's run the next few stages where dbd will do its magic. And done. Let's check this data. So in my database now, I have the nicer data with like proper name fields and the business logic applied. And all of that was just simply done with clicks. So in Metabase, I add my connector, which is my uh, database that I'd connected to, the BigQuery one. And if I look at my dashboard, like the basic dashboard even, I have a nice, uh, yeah, I have a nice representation of where my deals are, what stage I can figure out if there is an issue, what stage is the issue in. And all of this was just with a bunch of clicks. So yeah, I, that's, that's, that's the demo that I have. So thank you for the time. And I'm going to bring back Celine. And let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, Shruti. Thanks a lot. I mean, for everyone who's not a software engineer or data engineer, it's also very much possible to get everything up and running in a matter of, I'd say, even a quarter of an hour instead of an hour, even. Okay. There is one question from Francisco from YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. Where are the servers running for Restack? Is it EU or elsewhere? So we have servers running everywhere. So uh, if you prefer that your applications run in the EU, we can always have it run in the EU servers or like basically any location that you want. Fantastic. Great. Shruti, thanks a lot for, for showing us uh, the possibilities with Restack. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite over um, uh, Victoria, who will be telling us a little bit more about We'll be deep diving into the, the one part of scalable uh, data warehousing with open source, which is DBT. I think we've mentioned it throughout in every part of this uh, meetup so far, and also the past ones too. And she'll be talking about DBT and the role of analytics engineering. Um, Victoria? Um, yes, I'll, hi, I'll everyone. Um, so... There it is. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Victoria. I'm a team lead at, uh, of the analytics platform at Tier and um, soon to be part of DBT Labs. And I'm here to talk about the role of DBT in analytics engineering. First of all, what I would like to do is a recap of what the analytics engineer does. Um, next. Okay. Um, if we think about the roles in the data team, the analytics engineer will like in between the data engineer and the data analyst. This means that it will have a little bit of the skills from both roles. It will have the hard skills like the good software engineering practices of the data engineer. And it will bring uh, the analytical and the business mindset of the data analyst to the software engineering practices. And it's going to be more focused on the data transformation, make sure that we're following the good practices and the data is uh, good by the time it gets to the data analyst and the data analyst will be able to just focus on what they're good at, analyze the data. Uh, next, yeah. If we go uh, back to Marius' slide, this is the data platform that he presented and basically we're going to zoom in in the part of the transformation where DVT is going to be used. And before we move on, I would like to say, Something that I get asked a lot is that, can I not use DBT? Yes, absolutely. A lot of people do. And it has been like that for years. But the reason why you should use DBT is because it's going to make your development process easier, but also better, because it's going to help you introduce the software engineering practices. Next. Um, so what is DBT? If by now you still 
uh, don't understand what DVT is, is essentially a transformation tool, but it's going to help you with this uh, software engineering practices by introducing several layers to the development process. Uh, here we have the layers and you're going to be fast development of your models. Then it's going to allow you to test and document those models and then to deploy them using uh, tools like version control and CI CD. Uh, all of this can happen only by writing SQL. So if you know how to use SQL, you'll be able to use DVT. Everything will like code. And um, as Mario already said, this uh, DVT has an open source. It's open source. This is DVT core. And it also had a cloud uh, environment. So uh, it's also SaaS. Uh, but you don't need to use it. So we're going to focus mostly on the core part, so the open source. Next. Next. I think that this, this is slides where we skip, actually. So. Um, so let's go a little bit in detail into the layers that I mentioned before. And let's see how DVT is going to help you in each of these layers. So the first one previous one, sorry. Um, the first uh, uh, layer was development. What you're going to do in DVT, each model is a SQL file. So you're just going to write a SQL file like you normally would do to transform your data in your data warehouse. The difference here is that you're not going to write a DDL or DML. You're just going to write a select statement. And it's also going to allow you to use uh, Shinsha to write some other functions and variables. The functions are going to be called macros, and they're going to help you automate the code generation. And this file, at the end, you'll be able to run it in your terminal because you'll have a local installation of DVT core. And this will compile the code and push it to the warehouse. So what is going to do DVT for you is going to generate that DDL and DML code. It's going to compile basically your select statement by adding the create table, drop table if needed, create a view. So whatever needs to be done, DVT is going to add that for you, depending on how you run the model locally. It's going to resolve the schema name. It's going to use this macros that I mentioned before to add the database and the schema name where the table has to be both created and select from. This is going to ease the part of using several environments because you can use your sandbox environment and then you can use your production environment with the exact same model. And you're going to actually run the same command as well. And DBT is going to compile that and resolve that schema name for you. And this will also help to build and track the dependencies automatically. This means that DBT will know on which other models your model depends on. So if let's say you modify a model, then you'll be able to run all of the dependencies. You can run children and parent models as well. You can run the dependencies on test. And afterwards, you'll be able to also see a DAG of these dependencies. And uh, lastly, it's going to help you on track the sources that you're going to define and be able to check them as well. This is uh, more or less how a model will look like. On the left, you'll see the DVT model. See that here I'm defining uh, that it's a table. And then after all, it's like the big picture is just a select statement with this function, the macro that I was telling you. And we can see how it compiles to, depending on the sandbox environment or the production environment, it changes the schema name, both for the creation of the table and the select from. So some good practices in this layer are use those macros that I mentioned, never reference the schema. So never write select from database schema table, just the table with the macro. This way you can make use of all of the benefits. Uh, use macros. So your business logic lies only there and then you can use it in all of your models. Use variables as well. Another good thing is that you can modify the variables from the terminal when you run the mo your models and your models basically can adapt to your needs. And always define your sources with a freshness threshold. This way you will also be able to monitor that your data is fresh when you're building on top of it. Next. So no good model is uh, done un unless it's tested. DBT is going to also allow you to add test and the documentation to your models. This is going to go in a YAML file. So each model 
will be defined in a YAML file where you can add as much as descriptions and uh, test as you want. Something very important here is that this is not mandatory. If I don't write documentation about my model, nothing will happen. It will run anyways, but it's highly encouraged. This is a very good practice and uh, you should be doing it. DBT is going to give you three kind of tests out of the box, but you can run yourself and you can use packages. So, um, and it will also help you to render the documentation that you write in there and uh, render it into a website where you will be able to see that and the DAG that I mentioned before. Some good practices here would be to use packages, definitely, and write your own test. Make sure that you always have at least a non-null and unique on your primary key. Uh, run your tests on a regular basis, especially if you build models on top. Try to run those tests to make sure that you build only on good data. Uh, treat tests as assumptions about your data, not like just in case, kind of thing to know if there's another kind of value. It should work, and if it doesn't work, it should be an action. It should be there an action point. Use packages like DBT Sugar, DBT Meta Testing to enforce that documentation and also facilitate it. Make use of the DBT artifacts and the metadata fields also to enhance that documentation in a way that it works for you. Next. Um, and lastly, now that we have a model running, testing, documented, we're going to deploy it. And this means that we're going to put it into production. DBT will basically um, help us by all of the things that I already mentioned before, because it's going to change the schema names to the production. It's going to help us to test this. We can automate those tests as well as, as soon as we uh, merge this. And uh, next, some of the good practices here would be use pull request. You don't need to use a pull request to merge. This is basic version control uh, concepts, but use it, try to maybe define a template, try to automate many of those things. So once you do this template, you'll know what is very important for you once this thing goes to go to production. So try to automate those by doing tests. Try to automate the, um, the running of your test. Use version control from the very beginning. So try to use branches at a start development in a branch, and then use that, share that with your coworkers, um, make sure you, your model runs, the dependencies runs, and nothing is going in to break once you merge that to production. Use a temporary schema. So here is probably the only um, part of these layers where the SAS actually, the SAS, the Duty Cloud part, has a little bit more benefits because you can actually link that to your GitHub. And if you do it only with the open source, it can be a little bit more complicated. You still can do it. Um, so DBT, in that case, it would resolve the test schema. But if you don't do that, then uh, try to uh, maybe clone your schema and then test against it and run your model to make sure that it runs and it won't break your production. And um, yeah, and make sure to use the states uh, to always run whatever change in the PR. And that's it. Um, any questions? Yes, uh, thanks a lot for for kind of giving us a deep dive into into uh, how to use DBT properly. And um, you mentioned, I think, one thing that, that I was interested in, the the freshness th thresholds. Like, how how does that work? So so if you could describe that in, in short to to the audience. Yes, so it's it's very simple. When you're working in DBT, you'll probably have a bunch of models. So let's say like this text from the source, and then you apply some transformation, and then you'll do it in a way where you want to show it. All of this will happen within DBT, and you can select in any model for any other model. The first one will select from sources that can be anywhere. When you, Those are the only things that you have to define in the YAML file. Everything else you should, but you don't have to, and it will still run. Um, when you define those sources and you define that it comes from maybe a different database or whatever, you can define freshness, the field that you want to use. Maybe you have like a timestamp, like a loading timestamp or something like that. And then you define what threshold you want to, let's say hours, days, minutes, oh, and a number. And then you have to run it. So it doesn't do it automatically. You have to do DBT source snapshot uh, freshness. And it will tell you if any uh, of the sources, um, so like using this field, it's older. So the max of that field is older than the threshold that you define. 
It's pretty nice. Can also fail the job then. Yes. Great. Which which is kind of what you want, probably. Um, but you can also use it as a warning. So then still be building, but know that there's a problem and then go fix it. Fantastic. Be ahead of the problem. F fantastic. Um, I think one thing that that I wanted to, to ask you is, is also that you know you mentioned tests that implementing tests is very important. Like what have you seen as this kind of best practice in in not falling behind? Because in many cases, right, like it's people are behind in building tests. Yeah, I think this depends on how much you can be involved in the development process. Because many times you just had to take over a model that someone else built. If you're building a model from scratch, which is the easiest one, uh, then in there, try to think already what are this, the assumptions about your data, right? Before you get to your model. This way, you already have tests that will actually validate your development. And if you modify, because if you had to refactor this model or something like that, you're safe. Like you have this security that, oh, okay, the test will fail, so I cannot mess up. Otherwise, the test will tell me. So that's definitely the best practice. Try to think all of this, like, how does my data look like? Anything that you look when you do a select 10 or something like that from your table, from your model, that could be a test. Yeah, great. Um, one more last question before we go to the panel. Like, there's a lot of concept that you mentioned. I think for people that are, let's say, more beginners with DBT, it might have been a lot of information at once. What would yes. be the one point of reference resource that was very impactful for you and where others could ha have a look as well? Um, so at the very beginning of the slides, uh, if we share them there, I added a bunch of links about analytics engineering, DBT. DBT itself has uh, a learn learning platform with several courses all for free. They also have a page where you can go to projects, like pet projects from other people. I also have in my profile, which I also put my GitHub profile in there. Um, I have a sample project if you just want to start from scratch. I recently participated in a data talks cloth uh, course about data engineering, where we also went through one full week about DVT, implemented it, a tech stack kind of similar to what Mari's uh, show, simpler, but those are also some of the resources I would suggest. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite back Madi and also invite Kelly Bourdine from Wealthy. Um, so we can actually discuss some of these topics more in depth. Uh, Kelly, like since you're uh, say new new face here, could you please uh, give us an intro about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Kelly Burdine. I am the director of data science and analytics at a health tech startup named Wealthy. Um, prior to that, I was the head of data at an ed tech company called Aula, um, and I've had the the very uh, fortunate opportunity to be kind of the first data hire at uh, multiple startups now. And um, so I've I've definitely faced uh, a lot of the challenges that we've been talking about today and, and you know, often have to make the decision about what tooling to go with, whether it's open source or, or SaaS. And so I have a variety of experience in, in kind of both areas. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start off with a question to, um, to Mari, but it's actually to all of you. So, I mean, I think the, the business historically has a, bit, a big understanding, okay, building up infrastructure takes time, uh, right? And now suddenly we can cut down that time radically, but the buying of the business to spend time on infrastructure is still there. So like, where do we actually allocate this, uh, let's say, built up reserve, right? Because uh, if we want to ensure that we have a scalable system. Uh, Mari, maybe you can give a point on that, and then I'm also keen to hear from you, Kelly, or you, Victoria, as well. Yeah, I think I think that it's we reached a point where it got much easier to actually get started with multi core stack and also scaling it because a lot of the complexity that was um, a fact like just a few years ago is now abstracted away, and so you can get started with business to sell can can rely on the data stack to scale with a business in a very efficient manner. But you'll definitely reach a point where you should need to start locating resources to scaling your infrastructure, adding more tools. Um, in my presentation, I didn't tackle topics like data governance. Uh, when you have more data, you'll have new new issues about it, like how do you store your data? Can you actually uh, store specific types of data sets in specific locations and so on? And so I think that 
um, to get started, it's now much easier to have a baseline data stack that you can rely on on a fairly long amount of time. Uh, but eventually, the business questions will open technical questions about your data stack and will enforce you into a position where you have to actually add more components and add more technical complexity just because you, you have to over for reg regulatory reasons or for various types of reasons. Okay, so I read it that basically you should refocus that time on the business a bit more and then uh, interpret, okay, does that affect the infrastructure in any way? Nice. Uh, Kelly, maybe you could also give us some context on this because, I mean, starting at, at, at the beginning, right, many times, I think this gives you a perfect perspective on the problem and, okay, I can get something spinned up within a day, so I have some time to, to invest somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, scalability is is really huge. And, you know, what works for you today might not work for you six months, a year from now, depending on how fast your business is growing and the, and the type of problems you're trying to tackle. And so I think that's super important to keep in mind as you're, as you're choosing tools and choosing really where to spend your time. Um, and, you know, as at coming from, you know, an engineering or technical background, I'm sure um, Madi and Victoria especially will, you know, probably would love to spend tons of time making the infrastructure just perfect and everything. But there is a business, right? You have to be able to to make an impact. And I think that's that's really key. And so it's a careful balancing act, being able to make sure that you're delivering value to the company while still building something scalable. And so, you know, I think there's different pieces of the data stack that are, are kind of easier to, to swap in and out. And there's also a way to build things that make it easier to swap in and out. And so making sure those pieces that are very difficult to kind of swap out later that's where you need to be kind of spending your time up front um, and, and, and then choosing tools also that are really flexible around that. So I think DBT in particular is a good example where it, it, it integrates and is compatible with so many different things and having that really solid transformation layer also allows you to be able to swap out BI tools should you have a different use case um, or plug in different things. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's really important to consider. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, since we're talking about kind of the starting up part phase of building up a data team, um, Victoria, you spoke about the analytics engineer and, and his kind of in-between role. If you were to set up a BI team for a new company today, is that the profile that you'd start with or would it be something else actually, someone else? I'm not entirely sure if I start only with an analytics engineer, but yes, it was definitely one of the roles that I would look into at the very beginning because an analytics engineer can also fit, since it has the skills from kind of both, I don't say it can replace a data engineer or replace a data analyst, but it can help you at least start on that first part of the tech stack and then help you go in and try to drive uh, the business value that Kelly was mentioning before about. Because at the end of the day, you're uh, you're there because someone needs that data. So I think the analytics engineer can help you set up that. And then as your team keeps growing, you can hire more specific roles that they can encase that and make that better. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, any disagreements on that uh, in, the, in, the, in the round? Or is everyone pulling the same direction? I, I agree. I think the analytics engineer, you want to get that person in pretty early, especially if you're starting up a, a data function. Um, I've seen so many companies go down the route or they think data science is hot. Let's get a data scientist in. The data scientist comes in. There's no cloud data warehouse. The data is a mess. It's full of nuances and they spend all their time cleaning data and, and, you know, and they don't have the expertise to, to build out a, a scalable data stack. And so it just becomes this kind of vicious cycle and they feel like they can't make an impact. The company is like, why aren't we getting value out of data? And that's so difficult. And so, you know, I think an analytics engineer, like Victoria said, really has like a variety of, of skills from different areas. They're kind of like that middle person. They might not be able to come in and build some custom streaming solution or whatever, but usually that's not what you're starting with anyways. And so I think that's just, a, it's a really great place to start. And I, you know, and I, the, the uh, CEO of DBT Labs, Tristan Handy, I think actually wrote an article uh, or a blog article about this a few years back. So I'm so sure people could look at it, but he articulated it probably much better than what I'm doing now. But um, yeah, I, I'm 
second the analytics engineer. Okay, because like one, uh, let's say, tra like one school of thought would be rather first person just generate insights quick and dirty, right? Which this is like you don't need the structure if you don't get any information in. That's that's, that's kind of where I was take going at. But as I understand, you two are more like we have to build a sustainable data team from the beginning. So we should start at the core. That's how I interpret it. Okay, I have nodding heads. So so let's say that, that, that's that's what you had in mind as well. And great. Um, I think that we had a question in the in the chat that comes together with scaling the, the data warehouse, which is at which point do you actually switch out for and, and upgrade these open source solutions with more enterprise solutions? Um, Mari, would you like to take this one, maybe? Yeah, I think I think really. Most of the open source projects that at least I, I measured in my, in my talk are really reached that maturity point in which they can actually be production grade tools in your stack, um, whether on the data integration part, whether on the data management, and also, for example, if you take Superset, it's a really mature BI solution. Uh, on the data warehouse itself, um, I think serverless options are a great fit for potential scalability in your case, because if you rely on BigQuery, no matter how you, if you have one GB of data or 10 terabytes of data, it's going to scale of you. And even if you have petabyte size tables, it's going to actually scale. Um, there are scenarios in which eventually you'll have to put some of your data out of the data warehouse. And so that will add a lot of complexity uh, when you would actually need to manage that on, on a separate pattern, for example, of lake house um, design or lake house architecture. Um, but I do think that we're at that stage where you can start with open source technology and be certain that it will scale of you at fairly um, um, sufficient manner for your use case. And you have very specific scenarios in which you would need to, to upgrade something else or move to a SaaS platform, maybe to reduce costs because managing an open source technology is going to be too much of an overhead for your engineers. And so you move to something that's completely managed. Uh, but the technology itself is is very scalable. Okay, um, but at the same time, I think Victoria, you you mentioned okay, but DBD cloud, like okay, it is you know this the SaaS version of it, right? Um, and it seemed like you're you're like you're definitely making a case for it. So would you that that first like always go for DBD cloud? No, it depends on um, it depends on how technical your team is or the team you want to have or maybe you if you're building the team are um if you go to enterprise it's always easier right especially because you're paying money someone is going to pay attention to you and it's going to help you so if you don't and if you go open source uh then you'll have to put way more effort if you don't use dbt cloud for example you'll have to set up some kind of a scheduler um, you'll have to set up like the whole deployment process in there dbt cloud will really really make your life easier so um, it depends up to you. In that case, if you don't want uh, your team to be so technical, to spend that much time, you don't want to put that much effort into engineering, for example, and you want to have like a more um, like business oriented kind of like data team, then I would highly encourage to start from the very uh, start with DBT Cloud. So then you don't even have to spend time of that because then the migration will also be quite hard. It won't be worth uh, probably. So it depends on what you want to get out of it and how much engineering efforts you want to invest. Okay, okay. Um, okay, but this is, we just spoke more about two pieces of the stack. Uh, Kelly, like setting up companies again from the beginning in terms of the data team, which one, which ones do you go open source? Which ones do you consider, okay, actually I'm gonna go for a SaaS solution. It makes more sense for me. So which are the components that you choose one way or the other? Yeah, it's 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 not a, a a straightforward answer, and it really depends on the company and the team and and what you're trying to do with data. Um, and what's interesting is I think almost all or most of the tools that have been talked about in the last hour didn't exist ten years ago. Um, so it's kind of changed over time, which is quite interesting. Um, but I think certainly like depending on budget. Right, open source is is free, so I think that's the the most obvious one there. If you don't have a ton of 
upfront um, costs, sometimes that's the better route to go. Um, certainly if you have special use cases where, so let's say you're talking about extracting and loading data into your data warehouse and you look at something like Stitch or Fivetran and maybe they don't have a native integration to the source of data that you want to, to pull in. And so open source might be your, your next best option there as opposed to building something custom. Um, you know, and I think it also depends on what type of skills you have on the team. So with open source, it, there is more setup time there. You're going to have to maintain your tools. So there's, you know, there's some more technical overhead there that you have to consider. And if you're a team of one or two, maybe, maybe you can't do that. But I think that's also the benefit of something like Restack where that's, it's trying to solve that problem. Um, and so I think that's great. Uh, another thing to consider is security. Um, you know, based on your industry and sensitivity of your data. Some companies have policies where they want to keep everything in house. And, you know, if your data is persisting in a third party tool, um, that might not be okay for whatever you're doing. And so that might be another reason to, to, to spin up something open source and run it in your, your own uh, cloud instance. So these are all things to kind of consider. I, I wish I had like a really quick and an easy answer for you, but um, it sort of just depends. Yeah, I think mean, definitely use case dictates the solution, right? It should not be us dictating the solution, dictating the use case. So I can fully agree with that. Um, I think one, one part that is also kind of mentioned in the comments uh, by Alexandro is about that open data seems super nice. And also Mahdi, you, you, you mentioned that like you're very passionate about that project. Like what makes it so special? Um, that you know that you highlighted it so strongly. Yeah, I think I think the best answer to this is like um, one one sentence that um, the founder of Open Metadata actually said is that metadata management is soft problem. It's as a problem at its core, it's not very technically complex, um, and yet there are a lot of components and lots of SaaS offerings in, in the modern data stack that go and solve it again and connect again to your data warehouse to extract the information from it and connect to different tools to retrieve metadata for a specific use case. Sometimes it's for data quality, sometimes it's to build data catalog. Um, but the problem at its core is pretty much solved. Like you can actually have just one unified layer in the middle that offers metadata. And then whichever tool you're building, whether it's a data catalog, whether it's for data quality, you can just connect to one point via which for example, via APIs, via which you can have metadata on all of the tools on your stack. Um, and I think that's that's one approach that I feel very strongly about uh, because it's it's a layer that should have been solved a couple of years ago, and yet still a lot of tools go back to the drawing board and connect again to your data warehouse and try to solve again the metadata problem. Yeah. Uh... I mean, Victoria, you, you you mentioned in your in your presentation that that you know you try to also include as much information in DBT itself. Um, have you used also other tools to then you know integrate that information with all the other places as well? Uh, not really. I did work a lot um, in trying to select a data catalog, so I know very well the space out there, and it's very good, and it's adjusting a lot to the modern data stack. But yeah, I agree with Mari. It's something that should probably have been solved a while ago. I mean, Amundsen already, it was out at like probably several years ago and we still don't have something that adapts to this tech stack that we're all using now. Um, but yeah, only DBT uh, so far as the data catalog, the, data, the DBT docs, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. I mean, I think we're out of time. You know, we start on time, we finish on time. So it's what yeah. I, the entire goal is it's 60 minutes. It's it's nice and crisp. So we can also enjoy your evening. Uh, any last words, Mari, Victoria, Kelly, that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to thank you for, for having me. It was a great discussion. And also hearing um, the other talks, it was very enriching. Um, and yeah, it's it's exciting times ahead of us. Absolutely. Yes, same. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, feel free to reach out to the speakers on LinkedIn and 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 to maybe you know chat on the also on on the meetup group itself. Um, we will be sharing materials from this meetup as well. So so if you missed the beginning or something like like don't worry, we we got you covered. Um, and yeah, and looking forward to seeing you in the next one.
Great. Thanks. And have a nice evening. Bye. Bye.